Hey, what's up guys? This is Dr. Vivek Palipuram bringing you the next lecturette in ECP 170. In this lecturette, I'm going to cover memory fundamentals for MIPS assembly. Before we proceed any further, please make a note of the lab schedule. Your lab 10 is due April 14th, lab 11 is due April 24th, and lab 12 is due April the 29th. Now let's start our lecturette on MIPS assembly pertaining to memory fundamentals. Let's first discuss the stub program for MIPS that you guys will be using to write all of your MIPS codes. Now stub is quite useful for us to develop all of our MIPS codes because it gives us a nice structure and it essentially gives us places where we need to fill our code in. And it can be quite instructive as to what is going to happen inside of your MIPS code. Your stub is going to start with dot global main, which is the declaration of the main, then followed by dot text, which tells the assembler that all of your program's main code will be placed after this text. Then starts your main function. Now notice here that the main here is essentially a label. Inside of this main, you'll be placing all of your codes. Now towards the end of this main, you will always encounter two lines and those are load immediate $v0,10 and syscall. LI here, LI here stands for load immediate, which loads V0 with an immediate value 10. So that's another useful instruction or opcode in your repertoire now. So far, if you recall, we have only discussed arithmetic instructions and branching instructions. Load immediate is another simple instruction, which you can add it in your toolbox. So once you perform load immediate V0, comma 10, the next item that you execute inside of your MIPS code is a syscall or a system call. What the system call does is it looks for the value that is placed in the V0 register. Now the V0 register is actually your argument register. So it's an argument to your system call. Now because this argument is equal to 10 here, it refers to exiting of your program. So your system is going to exit your program. The next important portion of your stub is the dot data section after which all of your memory structures are going to be placed. So whatever variables you declare and initialize, what memory variables essentially, your arrays, all of those items will be stored inside of this dot data section or they will be mentioned after this dot data section. Now let's look into some MIPS memory access instructions. But first, let's look into MIPS memory declaration here, because in the DOM data section, you'll be declaring all kinds of memory variables. Well, specifically what you do is you ask the assembler to reserve a region of the memory in the data section, and then you refer to that region with a label. For example, I can declare a word, a 32-bit word called Z, and I can set it to 12. That's how I declare a word and set it to a particular value. I could also declare a space for 256 bytes in the main memory. Let's call it array, colon, followed by a space, and then dot space 256. So what it essentially does is it creates a chunk of memory which, is, uh, which has the size equal to 256 bytes. Now this 256 bytes you can use as you wish. For example, I can consider this as a space for 64 integers or I can consider it as a space for 256 characters. As a programmer, you have complete autonomy over the memory space that you have declared in the dot data section. It's also useful to note here that whatever strings that you would like to print inside of your main code, they are also declared in the dot data section. For example, let's say that I want to declare or I want to print a simple string called hello world that has to be declared in the dot data section. So here I give that string a label called message. Well, essentially I'm giving the label to the memory that is going to store the string. So message colon dot ASCII Z followed by the string that you would like to store in there. So remember Z here, array and message, they are all simple labels using which we will access the memory values. So you can use these variables or you can use these labels to access different memory values 
And not only that, you can also get the address information from these labels as well. You can find out at what address these labels are referring to. And there are some specialized instruction for you to use in order to get the addresses of the labels that these are referring to. So let's, let's move on. Now, before I show you some memory instructions, it is useful for you to note that MIPS cannot directly manipulate data in the main memory. And there's a very good reason for it. Now, when you consider the main memory, there are several hundreds of thousands of bytes stored in there. Now, just imagine an architecture that is capable of individually altering these memory variables. And let's say that you would like to perform some computations. Just imagine the amount of logic that will go in to be for the processor to be able to physically manipulate these memory variables. Now that such a processor will be quite beefy. In, in fact, it will be very unrealistic to achieve such an architecture. As a real world example, just consider a case where I am your professor who is teaching in front of the class and here are all of my students sitting. Now let's say each of you has some questions that you need to ask off of me. It will be quite unwieldy for me to travel from here, go to your individual notebooks and make changes to uh, your notebooks, essentially answering whatever questions that you have written inside of your notebooks. Not to mention, just imagine how crowded it will be for me standing on over your head and try to write inside of your notebook. That simply doesn't work. Instead, you can give me the information from your notebook so I as a processor can note it and work with my blackboard or whiteboard, which will act as my big register. So that is going to be one of the motivations when you perform your MIPS labs with memory. Your motivation will be to use registers to access the memory values. So this is what you guys will be doing. You'll be moving data actively between registers and the memory. So whatever values that you need to manipulate for the memory, you will get them from the memory first and place them in your registers make all kinds of changes to your registers. And once everything is done, you'll place the result back to the main memory. Remember, we cannot perform any arithmetic operations directly on the memory, meaning that I cannot perform add i z comma z comma one, where z is a memory variable. This cannot be done. Instead, z has to be explicitly loaded in one of the registers Let's say S0, for example, I'm going to make changes to this S0 register, and then I'm going to place the result back into Z once I am done. For all of these tasks, I'm going to give you certain instructions which you can use to do it easily. When we talk about memory fundamentals and accessing memory, there are some important questions that arise. Now, here's what I would like for you guys to do. What I would like for you guys to do is think about some questions that are going to pop up in your head when you're trying to access memory inside of your MIPS codes. What are the typical questions? You can pause your video here, try to write it down, and once you're done, you can unpause the video and I can show you the specific questions that are typically asked when we are trying to access main memory. All right, guys, I hope you got, got the chance to think about some questions that, are, that may arise when you try to access memory inside of your MIPS code. Now, one of the first questions that pops up is, what is the direction in which I would like to copy my data? For example, whether it will be from my processor to the data, to the main memory, or whether it will be from the memory to the processor. So question one is whether the direction of your transfer will be from CPU to memory, or whether it is going to be from memory to the CPU. So that's naturally the question number one, because in MIPS architecture, all of the operations have to be performed using registers. So if the memory variables have to be changed, somehow they have to be brought in to the CPU. The next question is, what is the specific memory address? So essentially what this question is asking is, how do I access value from a memory location? And how 
do I construct the address essentially? In fact, this is the most important question. How do I construct the memory address? That's question number two. Then questions three and four are these ones right here. What is the specific register name? Whenever I try to load a value from the main memory into the CPU, the target location, the destination has to be a register. And similarly, when I want to store a value back into the main memory, it has to go from a register. Essentially, this is my CPU and here's your register. Now your register is going to act either as a destination for a value from the main memory. Alternatively, it can also act as a source for placing a value inside of the main memory. So that's question number three. The next important question is how much data do I want to move? Whether I want to move one word worth of information or whether I want to move, uh, let's say, uh, 16, bi 16 bits or what have you. So how much data do I want to move? So these are the four questions that are typically asked when we try to access the main memory and we are going to see how each of these questions can be answered. So let's talk about question number one, the direction of the data copy. Now everything, the memory operation happens with respect to the CPU. So when I say load, that means I'm loading a value from the main memory into the CPU register. So we copy the data from memory into the register. And when we talk about store, we are storing a value from the CPU register into the main memory. So this nomenclature has to be clear here. Loading means loading a value from the memory and storing means storing a value from the CPU to the main memory. So this direction is very important for you to understand. So you can pause your video here and make sure that this particular concept is clear with respect to load and store. Load is loading into the CPU from the main memory and storing is storing a value from the CPU into the main memory. The next question is how do you determine the address using which we are going to retrieve a value or store a value. So there are many ways to calculate the direct memory address where we would like to place a value, but we are going to use one important method called the base offset method of storing the and loading the values from the main memory address. Now, there are several other methods which are commonly called as the addressing modes, but we are going to learn just one mode now, which is the base plus offset method. Now, base offset method can be understood in, a in, in, this, in this manner. Uh, let's say that you are new to University of the Pacific and your first class is in CTC 115. Furthermore, let's assume that you entered the John T. Chambers Technology Center from the southern end and the first class that you see is CTC, let's say, 110. If you happen to see that you are near CTC 110, immediately in your head, you know that um, your CTC 115 will be approximately, not approximately, well, exactly um, five blocks away from here or five classrooms away from here. So you are implicitly applying the base offset method of addressing. Similarly, inside of your MIPS code, you'll be using base plus offset method of targeting a particular memory address. You are going to work with a base address. Now the base address is going to be a really very huge number. In lab number seven, you must have seen that when you try to print the memory addresses, you must have printed really large numbers. Now such large numbers will be stored inside of your register. So we are going to store the base address inside of a register, and then we are going to use a constant offset from this base address to access the target memory location. In MIPS, we use this format to access a target memory location. So your base address will be a huge number which will, which will be typically stored in one of the registers, one of the many registers. They can be either S registers or they can very well be a T registers. The offset, however, is going to be a constant. So for example, in this case, let's say that CTC 110, this address is stored inside of a register as zero, then 
115 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's at an offset equal to 5 from CTC 110. We will use similar methodology to access memory addresses in MIPS. The next question is the register name. What is the name of the register to use either to store the data or maybe to load the, load the data? Or rather, what, what is the name of the register which I can use to place the value into and which what are the names of the registers that would be used as a source for storing the value back into the main memory? And the answer is quite simple. You are going to use the same set of S and T registers that we have discussed so far. So you have $S0 to $S7. Either of these registers can be used as the source or as the destination for memory operation. You can very well use T0 to T9 registers as well. It is totally, totally up to you. Remember, when you program with MIPS assembly or whenever you program with assembly language, the power is in your hand. With great power comes great responsibility. So you may have to use these registers quite responsibly in order to perform seamless and correct operations. By convention, we typically use S0 to S7 registers for one of these tasks, but nothing is preventing you from using T0 to T9 registers either. And it's totally up to you. Just make sure that you're consistent. The next question is, what is the transfer size? You can transfer a complete word. You can transfer half a word. You can also transfer a byte information as well. We have a separate instruction for each of these categories. So I'm going to show you what are the different instructions that are going to help you to transfer a full word and transfer half a word, or also to transfer a byte information. Please note here that we can perform transfer one word or one half word or one byte at a time. Oftentimes in our C programs, we work with entire arrays. Please note that there is no option to load an entire array, but instead you will have to set up some sort of a for loop and load the elements one element at a time. That's something that you have to do in your MIPS assembly. So it may become a little bit tedious, uh, but it, nonetheless, it will be a good practice for you and understand how the memory organization is for our computer systems. Okay, now without much further ado, let's discuss some data transfer instructions. So let's talk about the load instruction first. So load is with respect to the CPU. So when you say load, that means you're loading a value from the memory into the CPU. So loading happens from the memory into the CPU registers. The instruction that you're going to use for loading a one word worth of information is going to be LW, which stands for load word. The first argument is going to be a register, which will be the destination where the data has to be placed in from the main memory. So this can be one of your SRT registers followed by this big argument right here, which is the base plus offset addressing mode. So your base address will be stored in one of the registers, and this can be either S or T registers, one of the S or T registers, and this one right here is the offset, which will be actually a number. It can be zero, it can be four, it can be eight, it can be whatever that your program requires it to be. If you want to load a byte worth of information, then the instruction is going to be LB. Your destination is again going to be a register which can be S or T. Now notice here that we are loading a byte information into a 32-bit register. The next argument is similar, is the same as LW. You are going to have a base address stored inside of a register, and then you have an offset, which is a number. Now, let's talk about the store instruction. Now, the store instruction, what it does, it stores a value from the CPU into the main memory. So from one of the CPU registers into the main memory. If you have to store a word from the register into the main memory, you use SW instruction. The first argument is a register, which can be SRT. This time, SRT, they're acting as source registers. Whereas in this case, S and T, they're acting as the destination registers when we perform the load operation. So in store, S and T registers, whichever you're using here, it's going to be acting as the source, followed by 
this argument right here, base plus offset addressing mode, where your base address is stored in one of the registers followed by an offset is a constant. Similarly, you can store byte information as well using the SB instruction. If you're writing a C code that is manipulating arrays of numbers, you will be most likely engaged with LW and SW instructions. However, if you are working with arrays of characters, you are going to use LB and SB instructions more often than not. So these are the next four instructions out of which I would say LW and SW are more pertinent for labs uh, 10 and 11. Whereas for lab number 12, you may find that LB and SB instructions are more useful than LW and SW. Now let's take a look into an actual example as to how these instructions work. So let's say that I have an instruction LW $S1, 20, then in parentheses S2. Here, S2 stores the base address. Somehow, your program has to acquire the base address and place it in S2. Worry not, I'm going to show you specific instructions that are going to help you load the address information from the dot data section and place it in one of, the, one of these registers. And there's a simple instruction for that, load address instructions. So you can actually uh, tell me here what, what will be the opcode for that instructions. But no, let's not go there just yet. So let's focus on LW. So SW is going to store the base address at an offset equal to 20 bytes from this base address. I need to access a word from where I need to get the information and place it in S1. So S1 is your destination register. All right, S2 is your base address register. And 20 is the offset. And the amount of data that is transferred from this memory location is going to be equal to one word or 32 bits. It's going to fetch an entire 32 bit information. So that's simple, LW instruction. Let me also give you an example of SW here, just in case. Now let's say that I retrieved an information from, um, from this particular memory location, and all I want to do is just increment that value by one and place the result back. So next I can do something like this, add I $S1, $S1, one So I have incremented the value there. And then let's say that I want to update this memory address with this new value. Then I can just say store word, the source is S1 register and the destination is 20 and in parentheses $S2. So that's your example of storing info back to memory. And this is something you'll be doing in your MIPS labs. You are, you are going to actively load information from the main memory, do all of your hocus pocus, all of your arithmetic using these registers. And once you're done, you're going to place the value back into the main memory. Okay. So we are going to end this lecture right here, but before I formally end this lecturette, I would like for you guys to pause this video here and solve problem number one. This problem is in on your Canvas page, on, in your Canvas quiz. So pause this lecturette right here, try to solve this problem. As an example, let me show you how you can declare a memory variable. So let's say that I want to declare a memory variable called Z and set it to 20, I can do something like this. Z colon space dot word space 20. Furthermore, let's say inside of your main program, I would like to get this value of Z into one of these registers, say as zero, I can do something like this, LW $S0 Z. Let me give you some more example here. Let's say that I want to update this value. Specifically, I want to increment it by one. So I'll do something like this, and I $S0 $S0 comma one. Let's say that I'm done and I would like to place the value back in Z. I'll do SW $S0 Z. So here I'm loading from Z and, I am, and here I'm storing to Z. 
So that's an example of how load and store instructions will work with these labels created in the dot data section. Okay, I think it's a good time to stop this lecturette right here. You can stop this lecturette and move on to the next lecturette.